Very good. So, it's... Uh, how many more days are there to go now? And how close are you to enlightenment? Or to a bit of peace? <laughs> ah! Those only a few days to go. Oh, are you going to put lots of effort in? Are you going to strive? Are you... Are you going to do that? No, of course not. <laughs> oh, because at least you've been listening to some of the things I've been saying. And yesterday when I gave that sutta class on the, the right efforts or striving or right restraint, the right sort of stopping, that, that was a very important talk. And it's also because it was telling us just you know, how we should be meditating. That was always the case that when I saw monks really trying hard, you always thought that they're going to get somewhere. But I also always see those monks who really put a lot of hard work into their practice. They became so tight and tense and angry. They become frustrated. Because, you know, after a while you keep pushing and it doesn't seem to be getting you anywhere. And there is one of the suttas, it's not in my uh, little anthology, it's another place, where the Buddha was walking with his attendant, Ananda, and he saw these two monks. The first monk that he saw, this monk was sitting so perfectly straight, full lotus, right leg, over the left leg, intertwined, the right hand over the left hand, thumbs just slightly touching, straight back, chin in, meditating, not moving. And he looked at his attendant Ananda and said, I'm worried about him. And sure enough, a couple of weeks later, he disrobed. Yeah. So, <laughs> further deeper into the forest, he came across another monk. And this monk was sitting in the forest, nodding this way, nodding that way, and nodding all over the place. And <laughs> the Buddha turned to Ananda and smiled. I'm not worried about him. And a couple of weeks later, he was fully enlightened with psychic powers as well. And when I first read that, I said, there must be some error in translation. <laughs> that can't have happened. Surely that monk who's sitting really straight, not moving, he was a real fellow. The other one was just this lazy slob, a hopeless case. But it was the opposite. And of course, you ask, why? Why is that monk who was really putting effort, you know, was um, uh, disrobed, and the other monk uh, became enlightened? And of course, there's many personal experiences about monks like that. There's this French monk who would hardly ever, um, ever speak. And I remember spending a range with him in this very, very simple monastery. And every night, when we, every week when we had an all-night meditation, he would always be sitting bolt upright. He would, I never saw him just nod or fall asleep at all. He was, you know, on the outside, a perfect monk. And of course, you know, the monks would gossip with one another and say, oh, look at him. I'm watching him. He sat bolt upright all night. He must be just that far from being an arahat, fully enlightened. Then I went away somewhere and I found he disrobed. And he left. And I thought, why? I thought he was almost enlightened. And then he actually told people that what was happening was that he was trying so hard to be perfect. He was holding his body all night. He, and he said, 
He said to me personally, he said, sometimes Ajahn Brahm, I opened my eyes and saw you were half asleep, closer to the ground than to the, to the top. And he said, I was so jealous. I wish I could have done that. I wish I could have been sleepy. Because he was the control freak. So afraid what other people would think about him. And because of that, he was so tight and tense. He lasted four years. And I don't know how he could have done that. There must have been so much pain pushing himself, always trying to be the perfect person, and getting so much tightness inside that after a while he just could not stand it. And I remembered the story after that about those two monks. The first one, you're putting effort, you're trying, and you can do that for a while. If you want to see a person who is maybe not sitting but standing motionless for hours, and it's not Samadhi, it's not Jhana, so they don't get psychic powers. You can see those at Buckingham Palace. You know those guards, and you go out there, take a photograph, and they don't move. That is not Jhana. <laughs> that is just training. <laughs> but to be able to, to actually to sit comfortably for, for a long time, the second monk was, was letting go. Yes, he was tired for a while, but eventually the energies came back. Because I was sleepy in those early years, you know, nodding all over the place. And then one of the experiences which showed me what was going on and what the solution was, was when uh, we had to do some visas, renewals in Bangkok, and so we went down, and at this particular time, we were allowed to stay overnight for a few days at one of the royal temples called Wat Bawan. And it was a very wealthy temple. So they had a lecture room which was air conditioned. I mean, they didn't have air conditioning in these monasteries in those days, but this was one of the first ones which had one. And uh, we'd always get up, actually, the once we come to Australia, we get a bit lazy. We don't get up till four o'clock. But over there, we used to get up at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so, you know, we've we gone downhill ever since we came overseas. Four o'clock in the morning. Lackers. But anyway, we'd get up at three o'clock in the morning you know, and go into the, the forest you know, on the outside to meditate. And, of course, the... the, the Temperature was in the in the middle of the jungle. It was really hot and oppressive. And even that time in the morning, you were sweating. And not only that, you didn't have enough sleep. You know, we were supposed to actually and Charles said, you know, only four and a half hours, no, four hours a night. And during the day as well, just you know, total one day, four hours sleep, that's all. That was so hard to get four hours sleep. Because Four and a half was all I could get it down to. Could never make it to four hours. But you tried. You put forth effort. So you woke up in the morning. It was really hot. It was uncomfortable. I was sleep deprived. And also malnourished. You know, you know I told you, frog on rice. And even the rice, you know, was just... The soil was terrible in the northeast because it was just sand and whenever the rains come, any sort of nutrition and nutrients in the soil just all got washed away. So you know, even the soil, even the rice didn't have much all for nutrients in it. Very, very um, uh, uh, malnourished. Most, most of the people were really thin as well. So there was I. This is why I was incredibly thin in those days. I'm just making up for it now. It's called the middle way, no balance. <laughs> so, I was malnourished, uh, sleep deprived, in a climate I didn't really, I was used to. And of course you went to sleep. You know, because it was nature, it was just my body. And as soon as you went to Bangkok and you got some decent food, much more nutritious, and you get an air condition, no sleepiness at all. And it's wonderful, you can just meditate in the morning and just perfect uh, meditation. And I realized that it wasn't my fault. It was just the conditions around me weren't conducive. And I thought with all respect to the Buddha, 
if the Buddha had been born in London, he probably too would have fallen asleep under the Bodhi tree. <laughs> Not used to that temperature. And it was simply because of you know, physical stuff. So all of the, the force and the will in the world wouldn't help you. And you did use force. You had all these, these tricks. One of the things we would do was sit right on the edge. Right on the edge. Really on the edge. Right on the edge. So if you... <laughs> wow, I'm not going to do it. You had bad thoughts. <laughs> and I tried to make sure that that you know, wouldn't fall over. You just tight and tense all the time. Or you had the... Oh, I haven't got it here. have the matchbox trick. I know that there were matchboxes with all the little pieces of wood which just write the match. And you take the cover off, the sleeve off. So you just had the tray with all the matches on. And you put it on top of your head. You're in the meditation. So you put it on the top of your head and you close your eyes and you start meditating because if they'd fall on the floor. And then you have no doubt at all, you nod it off. Even a small one. So you'd be sitting there and just really putting mindfulness you know, on the matchbox just to make sure it never fell off. And it was an interesting um, little uh, technique because after about five or ten days of practicing this, the matchbox never fell off. And I thought, wow, great, I've, I have solved my sleepiness problem. And then that's when one of the other monks came, Ajahn Brahm, I was just watching you when you were meditating with the matchbox on top of your head and I found out why it didn't fall off. Because when you were falling asleep, instead of falling asleep the usual way, you fell asleep like this. <laughs> <laughs> then it's really so sneaky this mind and brain of yours. <laughs> so in the end, that's when I just uh, started, well, what, and especially the experience over in Bangkok, eating well, having a good night's sleep, and then just in a, a situation which was uh, conducive, not too hot, not too cold. There was no sloth and torpor. That had just gone. And all of that force, struggling, feeling terrible that I was sleepy when all the other monks were wide awake, I thought. I realized that I should have, from the very beginning, be used the wisdom power. Just understand why, why you sleep. And a lot of times, all it needs is just to adjust the externals and eat better. Now, there's simple things. When I first went to the northeast of Thailand, one of those monks, it was actually the monk who was uh, the Vietnam vet who got shot in the back of the head. He was two or three years senior to me. So I said, I'm always tired in this monastery. Now can, you, can you give me some meditation exercises to get some more energy up, to feel more alive? And you know what he told me? He told me this incredible, deep, spiritual piece of advice to get more energy up. He said, eat more rice. <laughs> the obvious thing which you never thought of. So I had a bit more rice in the morning, of course, your energy was up. It's obvious. Doesn't matter how many additives you put in your car, if you haven't got any petrol in it, it's not going to go. So, <laughs> little things like that, the wisdom pound, how often is it that we think that you know, we put forth more effort, try a bit harder, but it's the wisdom power. That is where you have this wonderful understanding and learn how to meditate really well. So one of those wisdom power teachings, and it's uh, uh, one of my favorites, so some of you have heard it before, but I'm going to indulge, I'm going to say it anyway. And it was a long time, I heard this years and years and years ago, it was in an airport, you know, just waiting to, for a plane and chatting with somebody, he told me this story. And he was Middle Eastern, and apparently it's an Iranian story from the, the teachings of Rumi. And 
sometimes I'm always interested just the way that Buddhist stuff goes, uh, you know, from one place to another place. You know, how it actually gets over to to different cultures. For example, there was, uh, I think maybe about 20, 30 years ago, that in the Catholic tradition, every day had a saint attached to it. So it had 365 day, days and 365 saints you know, to, uh, to worship for that day. And one of those uh, saints was Saint Jehoshaphat. I don't know if you know Saint Jehoshaphat's day, I think it was only in February or something. But the story of Saint Jehoshaphat was that he was an Indian prince who saw a, um, a s old man, a sick man, a dead man, and then a holy man. And as a result of that, he left the palace, went to, uh, to the jungles, found God, and converted the whole of uh, India to Christianity. <laughs> now, I think you can understand what that's referring to. We know there's a bit of tweaking, changing this and changing that. <laughs> that was the Buddha, you know, obviously. And somehow or other that got into the, the Catholic Church. Saint Jehoshaphat, they even called him a saint. And Jehoshaphat, now these names as they go from one, uh, one country to another, just from one land to another, you know, just like, like Chinese names or, or Indian names. You know, when they come over to Australia, you know, they can't pronounce that. So they call you Sam or Joe or whatever. Whatever's closest. And that's obviously what happened here because Jehoshaphat comes from Bhagawan. Bhagawan. That's where it comes from. So, you know, it was Bhagawan. And that was, you know, the story came with the silk traders and just the camel trains and they just kept on sort of telling these stories. And it was, oh, it was a very impressive person. A little bit here, a little bit there, changes, and that became one of the saints' days. However, as soon as they found out that who it really was, they cut him off the list. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we don't have a St. Jehoshaphat day anymore. <laughs> but anyway, that all these tales, they go from one place to another. And this particular one, it was the fakir and the farmer. The fakir, you know, was that, I don't know, that was the word, that was like the monk. So it was obviously it was a Buddhist story, and this was from you know, Iran, Persia, and of course that was, you know, just uh, uh, a very strong uh, stronghold of Buddhism many centuries ago. So it was obviously this was a Buddhist story. So the story goes like this: that there was a monk, a wandering monk, because that's one of the things we love to do, especially in those early years of our life. We just take our bowl and our robe, we just go. And in, still could do this in Thailand, in Burma, in many places. You just uh, walk. And then wherever you uh, stay at night, there's always a nice place. You can just lay down and have a rest. And in the morning, your bowl is your meal ticket. You go into a village, or whatever you know they give you to eat. It doesn't take much to look after a monk. In fact, monks are very cheap to look after. The monasteries cost all the money, because for a monk, when the first Ajahn Chah sent the first monks overseas of his monks to the west, it was to England, UK. And of course, imagine like a committee, oh, we, you know, we're going to invite these monks to come and stay with us, you know, can we afford it? How much does it cost to look after a monk? And it happened that just one of the uh, the trustees was a top economist. He was an advisor to the Bank of England and he also a lecturer, senior lecturer in economics at Reading University. And he was on the board of trustees of the English Sangha Trust. So they asked him, well, find out. Now, can we afford looking after a monk? Or maybe two monks or three monks, even a nun. And so he he did his research, he crunched the numbers, as they say, and he came up with a figure how much it cost to look after a monk. And the way he put it was so memorable. His name was uh, Professor Colin Ash. 
Uh, and he crunched the numbers and he said, well, it's much cheaper to look after a monk than to look after a pet dog. <laughs> and once he said that, just so many ideas started coming out because the similarities are, you know, have a little dog in your garden, you build a nice little kennel for him. You know, for a monk, it's just a, a, a cootie, they call it, a little bit bigger, but the same idea, just in a simple room there, just one room <laughs> laying on the floor. There's you know, even my little cave. And it's, it has many similarities to a kennel. <laughs> a little bowl, you eat out of a bowl, just like the dogs do. They're very friendly, you know, you take them for a walk and they wag their tail, you ask them give a dumb a talk, and they're, wah, 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 and they're very, very friendly, you can pat them on the head, but not this month, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, the world was going around that every home should have one. Wouldn't you like to have like a little monk or nun in your backyard, back garden if you have one? and just live and just put a bowl of food every day and just pat them on the head <laughs> and he goes inside and meditates and when he wants some exercise you take him for a walk and it gets all this wonderful <laughs> wisdom back. So it doesn't cost that much. <laughs> so anyway, that's why the monk's very easy to wander around with no possessions, everything you carry on your back and, and just not much, you don't need much. You know, you don't need that much to live. So anyway, the, that was the tradition, wandering monks. And then in this uh, particular place, this monk was wandering. And when you get to a house, a farm, if it's like a Buddhist or even just a kind person, they will stop and ask, how can I help you? They'll give you some food. Not money. I know in some of these places, fake monks, they go and ask for money. So please never, ever give money to a monk begging on the street. Sort of, I, I know I'm a bit mean and nasty, but I said, if ever you see anything like that, just, oh, please, monk, just wait for a moment. I'll get you something. And get some of the smelliest, oiliest, greasiest of curry. Put it in all over his back notes. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't do that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but anyway, real monks are just accept food. So anyway, the, uh, in the morning, at the right time, so the monks would go on arms round, and you've got this old monk got to this house. It's the old monks don't lie story. This old monk got to a house. It was an old farmer lived there. And the farmer just saw it was a monk coming, was so excited, and got the monks some food. The wife came out also to greet him. They had two little kids and a nice dog. And then the farmer, having given you know, some food, to the monk, just ask him, it's getting close to the rains retreat, like it's close to the rains retreat now. And they said, have you got a place to stay yet for the rains retreat? Because you're not supposed to travel, you're supposed to stay in one place. And this old monk said, actually, no, I haven't got a place to stay yet. So the farmer went down on the ground and said, please, Venerable Sir, stay with us. We may be poor, but you know, we're farmers, we've got enough food, maybe simple food, but we can actually feed you. And all I would ask is, you know, to get the blessings from you and maybe just once a week and come and give us a little Dhamma talk, you know, help our little kids, you know, be good children. And that's all we ask. So the monk said, okay. So the farmer, he built a very simple hut in the meadow next to the, the river so he can bathe and get water doesn't take much. And every morning the monk would come for arms round and to give the blessing and give some wise pieces of advice you know, for the children, looking after your, your parents, not fighting with one another. How many mothers do you have? Only got one. <laughs> well, you better look after them. And you, oh, yeah. And uh, after two or three months, the whole family, they just loved this man. He was like a grandfather, so wise, so kind. And even the little dog would always wag its tail when the monk came close. 
and just was just just love the sort of the kindness and the warmth and the softness. And so when the day came, the end of the range retreat, and the monk said, "Range retreat finishes this evening. Tomorrow I will have to continue my journeys, my wandering, because I am not attached to any home." Only the rains retreat when the monsoons come to I need a dwelling. I'm going. Oh, no, please don't go. The farmer went down on the ground. The wife also went down on the ground next to him crying. And the two kids started screaming. And even the dog put his <laughs> tail between the legs and started whining. Please don't go. And the monk said, look, I have to go. Now, I've been teaching you about attachment and letting go. We all have to go sometimes. Tomorrow I will go. But, he said, you have been so kind, such good supporters, and this range retreat, my meditation has been so wonderful. In my meditation, I can share this with you, I've discovered much closer than you think, there's a big, a massive buried treasure. You've been so poor. And I found that buried treasure. I don't see why you shouldn't have it. So that you don't need to live in poverty anymore. It's amazing, even though they were very sad at the monk going, the prospect of a, a buried treasure being really rich, <laughs> they start crying. Why does that work? <laughs> And he said, but you have to listen carefully. Pay attention. Be mindful. Remember the instructions. If you follow the instructions, you will find that treasure tomorrow and you'll be rich. Or listening. Even the, two, even the dog was listening. <laughs> and he said, tomorrow morning, at dawn, stand in the doorway of your little hut. Wait for the sun to start rising. Face the direction of the rising sun. Pick up that bow and arrow you use. Point the bow and arrow in the direction of the rising sun. And when the disk of the rising sun separates from the horizon, then let the arrow fly. Where the arrow falls, you will find the treasure. Remember the instructions. If you follow them, you will find that treasure. I'm an old monk. Old monks don't lie. Oh, they were stunned that tomorrow they'd be rich. Of course, they missed the old farmer. They missed the old monk, but more well, they'd be rich. So I hardly went to sleep at all. Is it dawn yet? Is it dawn yet? When's it going to be dawn? <laughs> and he was up there an hour or two before dawn, waiting and waiting. And then, as the light started to appear on the horizon, he stood on, stood on the, the doorway of his house. He had his bow and arrow ready. And as the sun came up, he pointed the bow and arrow, aimed the bow and arrow in the direction of the rising sun. As so it rose, 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 he couldn't wait. And when the moment when the, uh, the sun separated from the horizon, he shot the arrow and went a long way. And the whole family chased after it. Wife, two kids and the dog. And when they got to where the arrow landed, the wife had to dig the hole. That was Asian culture. But Asian culture, Western culture, the law of karma happens no matter what culture you're in. So the woman was digging the hole, digging and digging deeper and deeper, and what did she find? Nothing, only trouble. Because that field where the arrow landed belonged to a lawyer. And the lawyer was just coming for a walk that time of the morning 
and he saw this woman digging a hole in his property. And he said, you can't do that. I sue you. I'm going to take everything you own. It's illegal. It's a crime. You can't destroy other people's property. And the wife said, not my fault. My husband told me to do it. <laughs> okay, you're sued. And, <laughs> and then the husband said, no, no, the old monk. It's old monk said we find that big buried treasure here. And at that, the lawyer stopped and said, did you say old monk, Buddhist monk? Yeah, old Buddhist monk. I'm a Buddhist, said the lawyer. And old monks don't lie. What did he tell you? <laughs> Be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> what did he tell you? And he said, he said, uh, all the instructions, stand on the threshold of the house and uh, uh, let the arrow fly. And the lawyer said, look at you. You're so thin. You've got no meat on you at all. Look at me, said the lawyer. That I am, I'm well fed, I am strong, I am smart. He said, look, I'll do a deal with you. I will shoot the arrow tomorrow morning. I'm sure I'll get the treasure. But because you told me about it, you know, I'll give you 10%. And the dog started barking. <laughs> so, okay, well, uh, uh, 40, 60. Whoa, 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 the dog. Okay. Well, look, you know, I got a sort of, you know, uh, all my administrative costs. 51, 49 in my favor. And that's the best they could do. Even the dog, oh, okay. <laughs> so they signed the contract. If you have a contract lawyer, so the sign of contract, 51, 49 percent. And so the following morning, the lawyer was there early. And as the sun rose, he stood at the door of the house, uh, <laughs> aimed the bow and arrow in the direction of the rising sun. And as the disk of the sun rose above the horizon, he shot the arrow. And it went a lot further. And they all ran after it. The poor lawyer was puffing and panting as he was running. But they all ran after it. And when they got to where it landed, the law of karma. This time, it was the farmer's job, you know, to dig the hole. What you ask somebody to do today, you'll have to do it tomorrow. <laughs> it comes round. So the farmer was digging the hole, digging the hole, and the lawyer was egging him on. Come on, come on, it's a treasure there somewhere. What did he find? Only more trouble. Because this time, the, la the, the arrow uh, was in the land belonging to a general in the army. And the general was coming with his soldiers. He said, what are you doing? You can't destroy my property. Soldiers, cut their heads off. All of them, including that dog. <laughs> said the dog whining. <laughs> And the man said, it's not my fault. The lawyer made me do it. The lawyer said, it's not my fault. He said, it's the old monk. An old monk told us we'll find a treasure here. And the general said, put your swords away, soldiers. Because I'm a Buddhist too. Now don't ask me what is a general cutting off people's heads doing, being a Buddhist. Don't spoil the story. <laughs> I'm a Buddhist too. What did the, what did the, uh, the monk tell you? And when he gave him his trial, he said, look, lawyer. What does a lawyer or a farmer know about shooting an arrow? You've got to be in the military. We train in archery. You know, we practice archery. I will shoot that arrow tomorrow morning. And being a professional archer, I'm sure we'll find the treasure tomorrow because old monks don't lie. And they've got no choice. So it's either that or sort of have their heads cut off. So generals have a very persuasive way of closing a deal. So the following morning, the general was there in the, in the house waiting for the sun to rise. And as the sun rose, 
He picked up the bow and arrow and he stood with all of his military stature and he pulled the string back such a long way. This fellow was just really top of his archery game. And as soon as the sun separated from the horizon, bang! And the arrow flew such a long way. And everybody ran after it, including the kids and the dog and the lawyer panting away, but he was excited. He's going to find a treasure today. And where it fell onto the ground, whose turn was it now to dig the hole? The lawyer, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the lawyer got the spade and dug and dug and dug. And what did he find? Real trouble this time. Because that landed in the garden belonging to His Majesty the King. Royal property. And all the royal guards arrested all of them. And pulled them in front of His Majesty the King. There was a general there and the lawyer, the farmer, his wife, the two children and the dog. Yeah, don't forget the dog. In front of His Majesty the King. And the king addressed the general. He said, General, I ex maybe I could expect this of ordinary people, but of you, you should know better than this. You're one of my most trusted generals, one of my most loyal fighters. But the law is the law. You'll know the penalty for destroying royal property. It's execution. I'm going to have to kill all of you. It's the law. And at that, at that, the general said, it's not my fault. <laughs> the lawyer, he's behind this. And the lawyer, no, no, it's not my fault. It's the farmer. And if it's not my fault, your majesty, it's the old monk. And at that, the king said, what did you say? <laughs> it's the old monk who said we'll find a treasure here. Old monk said his majesty, because his majesty was a Buddhist too. And he said, old monks don't lie. What did they actually do? What were the instructions? When the king heard the instructions, he couldn't figure out what mistake they made. So he said, I'm going to commute your sentence for a week or two until I find that monk. I want to find out what's going on. So they put all oh, the general and the lawyer, the, <laughs> the husband and wife, the farmer and his wife, and the two kids and the dog, they put a nice little cell for the little dog, Really nice food in there, but didn't get any exercise in jail. But still, you know, he could sleep all day. It's not bad for a dog being in jail. But the king sent all of his soldiers out to try and find, track down this monk and find out what was going on. They eventually found him. They brought him back into the palace in front of all the other people accused on death row. He said, monk, you've got these people into very big trouble. They'll be executed because of you. Why? And the monk said, because your majesty, they never followed the instructions. All the things I've been teaching the last four or five days, have you followed the instructions? You've been digging your meditation hole, what have you found? Nothing, only trouble. <laughs> <laughs> they, they never followed, why did they go wrong, said his majesty, really intrigued. He said, Your Majesty, explaining it is not really good enough. I will demonstrate, I will show you. Actions that speak louder than words. I invite you, Your Majesty, please come to this poor person's house tomorrow morning. I would invite, I will be there too. I would invite you to follow those instructions. And I will guarantee you, absolute guarantee, that we'll find that treasure tomorrow. And it's such a huge treasure that I ask you to please split it five ways evenly. Five ways, yeah. One for the king, one for the, uh, the lawyer, uh, the, the, the general, one for the lawyer, one for the family, and one for the dog. <laughs> That's supposed to be four ways. Four ways, and it'd be enough for you. You'll be happy, let alone this poor family. They'd just be, you know, so wealthy compared to where they come from. The kids, okay, let's go. So the following morning, they all met at the, 
this poor man's hut. His Majesty the King was there, standing at the doorway of the house, waiting for the sun to rise. And he looked at his position to make sure, following instructions, he looked to the monk, and the monk said, Correct, Your Majesty. So as the sun rose, he, the Majesty picked up the bow and arrow. Correct, Your Majesty. The sun rose further, His Majesty the King pointed the bow and arrow in the direction of the rising sun. Correct, Your Majesty. Just at that moment when the disk of the sun separated from the horizon, he turned around about to shoot the arrow and the monk said, Wrong, Your Majesty. I never said, shoot the arrow. I said, let the arrow fly. And the king thought for a few moments and understood. He opened the thumb and forefinger of his hand and the arrow tilted down and fell right between his feet where he was standing. And they dug a tiny hole. And there they found this huge treasure. He said, I told you the treasure is much closer than you think. It was right where he was standing, right between his feet. He let the arrow of gravy go. And where does it fall? right where you are, sitting here on the, <laughs> this cold hall with a huge teddy bear on your lap, <laughs> tired, hungry, whatever, it falls right here. And there you find the greatest of treasures. In the present moment, right <laughs> where you are, right, and it's not just um, treasures of money, they've got the money as well, so that little dog, you now from that day on, or just for a few days afterwards, that little dog lived in a air-conditioned kennel with many different rooms. There was a TV room, an exercise room, a lounge room, <laughs> and he even had room service. He learned how to press little buttons, what he wanted to eat that day, out of gold and <laughs> out of golden bowl. That was a nice wealthy dog after that. <laughs> but that's not really what the treasure was. The treasure was to understand when you let go of the arrow of craving, you find what you have right now. Where you are, in this moment, right here, wherever this happens to be, there you find a treasure beyond your wildest treasure of contentment, happiness, that's a story. And that, you know, that's such a true story. I know that. You know why? Because I'm an old monk. <laughs> <laughs> and old monks don't lie. So, where are you shooting the arrow today? What are you trying to get? Where are you going to try and, and run and dig a big hole somewhere, and what do you ever find? Nothing, only more trouble <laughs> in your life. So this is one of the reasons why we, we learn from that lovely story about contentment, being here, right here, and right here, that's where you find the truth. Ah. Another little similar story about letting go, all about the right efforts. There's actually basically no effort, it's just stopping. Where you are, instead of going over here, go, where are you right now? Be here. Go deeper into this moment. Similarly of the lotus. Go right inside and there's incredible lotus petals inside. But, we also have some of Ajahn Chah's similes. One of Ajahn Chah's most wonderful similes about meditation. I forgot. For years. Because he told this story when I first went to Thailand. And just you know, like me, sometimes you have these stories, we keep telling them, and after a while they go off the radar, and then some time you remember them again, you start talking about them again quite a few times. And then you this is what happened with Ajahn Chah, this was one of his similes. And I remember hearing it, 
you could say it on and on and on, and many days in a row to different people, and then sort of never heard it for, for years. Until you heard it in your own mind, remembered it, because it was appropriate to what was happening in your meditation. That was the story of the, the mango orchard. And it's a terrific story. It just shows you the place of things like right effort in meditation. And just how so much of it is counterproductive. Because he said that his monastery, which was what Papong, he said it was a mango orchard whose mango trees were planted by the Buddha himself. I told you Ajahn Chah was unconventional. I'd never heard that before. And there's no mango trees in that monastery. What's he talking about? Mango trees planted by the Buddha. Buddha was 2,500 years ago. The mango trees would be dead by now. Oh, dust. What? No mango tree lasts 2,500 years. So what's he on about? And then he started saying that those mango trees planted by the Buddha, they're still there and they are so ripe and plentiful are the mangoes that they are just so sweet. And there's thousands of them there. Yeah, what's going on? But he said, these days you cannot climb the mango tree to get the fruit. You won't be able to reach it. Or the other way they used to do it is throw sticks to get the, the mango to fall. You'd always miss them. Try and get a ladder, it's too high. Shake the tree, they won't fall. There's only one way, and only one way to get the juicy sweet mango which has been planted by the Buddha. And that is, sit still under the tree. Sit and don't move. Hold out your hand and a mango will fall. I thought, come on. You know, I've done science degrees, I've seen mangoes. You know, how long do you have to wait sitting under a tree with a hand out? Come on. And if, you know, because the birds get those mangoes first, so those mangoes are ripe, the birds get in there, they can fly up, they can get it easy. So they, they usually eat most of the ripe, the sweet mangoes. And if one did fall, what's the chance of it falling right in your hand like that? It's more likely, you know, knowing our luck, my, my negativity, it's more likely to fall on my head. <laughs> to fall in my hand. Crazy. And I really dismiss that as a crazy teaching from a mad master. Shouldn't have done that because some of the stuff he said was you know, just beyond me. And that seems beyond me. Seems beyond people. But it came from a great monk and so somehow or other you remember it. You know, it gets stored in the interesting but don't understand part of your brain. It's very big, that part of the brain. <laughs> And then, obviously, later on, when your meditation started really going well, then things started to happen. You understood. Wow. That is so true. If you want to get some nice meditation, deep meditation, great insight, sort of stuff you read about in the books, what do you do? You're already under the Bodhi tree, mango tree. Nice monastery like this, a nice retreat center, good people around you, good, uh, good food and good accommodation. You're already under the tree. Now what do you do? Are you trying to climb the tree and get something? Only a few days left, I better struggle, better do something. Imagine what my boss will say when I go back. Yeah, you had a week off? Where do you go? Do you go to the Margaret River and see the wineries? Do you go to... Alice Springs and Sears Rock, you came all this way to Australia, what did you do? What did you, what did you see? Just saw my breath come in and going out. <laughs> You're crazy! 
So people think, I better do something quick to justify what I'm coming all this way, spending all this money. So a lot of people try climbing the trees. Yeah, don't get anything. Breaking the tree, come on, get me something. That doesn't happen. Throwing things up in your mind, come on, get to get a jar, come on. It doesn't work. You can't reach it. What you do is you think perfectly. In this moment, letting the arrow of craving fall, not wanting anything in the whole world, being here, opening up your heart. And blop, 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 blop. It all comes to you. Weird, but that's how it works. You go chasing things, chase them away. Sit still with beautiful kindness. All these sweet, juicy mangoes. They call them like the fruits of meditation, the fruits of the path. They just come to you. When you strive, they never come. Next simile. Oh, cracky. Next simile, I think I mentioned this briefly before. So I would need an assistant. Uh, would you? You put your teddy bear down, can you come up? Because are you an honest lady? <laughs> Very good, so now just because I don't want you to try and impress me, I just want you to be as honest, and if I make mistakes, please tell me. Please tell everybody. Now, I have this cup of water here, an ordinary cup of water, yes. It's not a magic trick. <laughs> <laughs> I'll now make you disappear. <laughs> 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 I... I've got this glass of water. Now this water represents now, your mind. I'm trying to keep it still. When you're meditating, it's hard to keep the mind still, isn't it? There's always things you've got to think about, or someone makes a noise, and you know, you've got an itch here and ache here. So, that's my, my mind. And I'm going to try and keep it still. Now, is it still yet? Or is it moving? Why? I'm not paying attention, am I? And now I'm going to be mindful. I'm going to be mindful of the water. Has it stopped moving yet? Okay, it's moving. So now, <laughs> the video is crazy. <laughs> now, it's because I'm mindful, but I'm not concentrating. So I'm now going to mindful, be mindful of this water and concentrate it. And I'm going to strive. My striving is to keep this still. <laughs> come, come on, harder budget. You're moving. Moving, yeah. <laughs> now this is how so many people meditate. Okay, you know, your mind's all over the place, it's wandering around, it's never still, so you say, I'm mindful, come on, watch. And then put force, come on, hold it still, I'm hold it still. And then, it's so frustrating. And then one day, this smarty pants monk, comes along, I'm not really smarty pants, I don't wear pants, smarty <laughs> robe monk, comes along and says, so easy to keep the mind still. So easy to keep the water still in the cup. Because all you need to do is, yeah, <laughs> put it down, let it go, stop grasping, leave it alone. Now, how about that? <laughs> She's breathing on it. It's better now. Better now. <laughs> okay. Wait for a while, come on. Yeah! <laughs> In that demonstration, <laughs> that teaches people how not to meditate and how to meditate, how to keep it still. You know, just you see that, that's just such a charge simile, but it's so easy in the moment. But what, you know what many people do, I never demonstrated this problem. It's a called impatience. So you put it down and you say, is it still yet or not yet? <laughs> 
Ja, ja. Nej, nej, ja. Det var inte störbig. Så. That's called letting go. What Ajahn Chah used to say about this, and, and I haven't mentioned this at this so far yet, he didn't have the glass of water, similarly, but he would use his hand. And he would wave his hand up like this. And he would say, this is a leaf on a tree. It only moves up and down because the wind is blowing. If the wind stopped blowing, would it move? Yeah, it would move. But less and less and less. Until the leaf, because of friction, would come to perfect stillness. Its default state. Its original natural state to be still. It only moves because something outside of it, the wind, is making it move. So, if you have, this is your, your mind. The only reason why your mind moves, why it's restless, why it thinks, why it doesn't come to this beautiful stillness, is because there's a wind blowing. A wind of wanting something. Even something good is still wanting, still agitates the mind, and means it doesn't come to stillness. The wanting, the wind, that's what makes a mind move. But he said something quite profound, the natural state of your mind is to be still. Just leave it alone, you don't have to hold it still. Just leave it alone, protect it from all winds of wanting, and you find it becomes still all by itself. Amazingly, profoundly, brilliantly still. So, it's why we, I really try hard to make a comfortable retreat center for you, so you don't want for anything. Nice, warm, uh, calm, uh, good food, nice place to rest, and I say, I repeat this, even at this time of the retreat, any time you need a rest, you go back to your room and just take a nap. It doesn't matter, you say, well, I wasted an hour, you make an hour later up. You can stay up later in the middle of the night if you wish and just take a couple of hours off the, the night time. It's very cool and peaceful at that time. So you can just, if you feel tired, sleep. You wake up, someone's already following my instructions. And, hey. <laughs> <laughs> very obedient. But <laughs> when a person, um, they stop wanting, they rest, they relax, they're at ease. And then you find, yeah, we, but I'm sleepy. You just need to recharge your energies, your batteries, and you start to get alive. You now what happens sometimes, you're sitting here doing nothing. Or just like this little novice story. It's another part of the, the right effort. The stop. Because this little novice, he was... <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, compassion. This little novice, they were... Ajahn Chah was giving a talk. And Ajahn Chah's talk, <laughs> they sometimes go on and on, and on, all night. Sometimes you would do that. It would, you'd go there for an hour's talk, and it would keep going on, and just hour after hour after, and it wasn't like it was, it was inspiring. Some of what he said was, please excuse me, was, you know, just rubbish. <laughs> and I say that, you know, out of respect for my teacher. But every now and again, he'd say something which was really profound, very deep, and it was worth it. It's just like, you know, you're digging for like diamonds or digging for gold in the, in the, 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 the cave, in the mine. You dig, 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 and then you find one. It's worth it. So that was where like Ajahn Chah. But anyway, when he was uh, giving this talk, there was a little novice monk. And this little novice, about eight, nine, ten or something, 
they go into the monasteries because they've got no, no parents or they've been abused or their parents, you know, one may go to jail or something. And so the, it's a safety net. So this little novice was there in the evening listening to Ajahn Chah go on and on and on. And on and on and on. And on and on and on and on and on and on. When's this going to end? When's Ajahn Chah going to stop? When's Ajahn Chah going to stop? When's Ajahn Chah going to stop? And that became like, you know, repeated, like going around in a loop. When's he going to stop? When's he going to stop? And every now and again, there's something we call insights, which is just seeing things from another angle, turning it around. And this little novice, just one thought, not when, am I, when is Ajahn Chah going to stop, he thought, when am I going to stop? And this little novice stopped. When he opened his eyes, it was the morning, the monks had gone off for arms round, and he was a happy little novice, blissed out of his head, beautiful mind. He'd stopped and got into a really deep meditation. So deep, he didn't feel any aches or pains in his body, he didn't feel or hear all the monks doing, they don't do the sadhana, that's Ajahn Prab. He, no, I've got the patent on the sadhana, sadhana, sadhana. <laughs> he was, they, they bowed, they did Arahang Sama, did their chanting, got their bags, went out, talked to each other. He hadn't heard a word of it. Deep inside, perfectly alert, aware, a jhana experience. How did he get that? Not strive, but stop. Not wanted something, but stop wanting. Not wanting to stop wanting, that's more wanting, but stopping. And there, in that stillness, he let go of the arrow of craving. Found a really big treasure, right where this little novice was sitting. That is what meditation is. Sometimes we go round and round doing this and doing this. And sometimes it's frustration. Frustration is so good. Because after a while you just give up. No, oh, what's the point? Give up. <laughs> so many times, oh, wow, I better give up. <laughs> <laughs> but one, there is one nun. She's over Dhammasara. I can't say who she is, but you can ask around to who it was, but she was on one of my retreats over in um, Thailand, one of these executive retreats. And she's not a Thai, Thai nun, it's not her. There's one Thai nun there, but this is not that one. And she was meditating nine days, very smart girl, getting nowhere. You know what it's like last day? Well, I was sort of peaceful maybe. It's exaggerating a bit, but anyway, we finished the retreat off and then her taxi taking her to the airport to go back to her home country, not going to come for another hour. So, had nothing to do, waiting for a taxi, already packed. So what do you do? Just went into the meditation room to kill time. <laughs> That's what I said, just kill time, nothing to do. And that was her first time in the whole meditation retreat, she meditated not trying to get somewhere. Just kill time, and she meditated nine days. Got nothing. So what you know, what's the chance of getting anything now? An absolutely zip. So I just sit down, I just sit down, killing time. And that was when she came out afterwards. You know, I was having having some lunch or something, and she came up to me and had these big wide eyes. And said, oh, I just, 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 <laughs> You got a really first, really deep meditation experience. And she was just so... And the only thing I could sort of picture is just, you know, when you're very young and stupid and you fall in love for the first time. Oh, I've met this wonderful world. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's emotionally so high, which is really cute to see. She just got her first really, really deep meditation experience. And how did she get that? 
Give that go. Gave up. Kill time. Nothing to do. Hasn't worked now. Won't work next. So to let go. There's a lot to be understood from that. <laughs> so at this stage of the retreat, how, how long have you been meditating? I've known some of you for years. You've never got anything in the meditation. You're not going to get anything now. Just forget about getting jhana. Forget about getting enlightened. No hope. It's not going to happen. You know, so just, just the rest of the retreat, just kill time. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> if you believe me, it might work. <laughs> but you know, that sometimes that's what happens. Sometimes you're sitting here and just... Sometimes I call it pressing the letting go button. There's a letting, letting go button there somewhere, just you know, really let go, I mean, fully letting go, 100% letting go, not doing anything. Just sitting there, just holding your hand out with kindness. And then, it's amazing, things happen. For anyone. Find that letting go button. Bam, bam. But if it does start to happen, don't go, is it still yet? Come on, be more still. I've only got another, another two hours for bed, for for lunchtime, come on. <laughs> I've got to get all these nimitas and these jhanas and the psychic powers all finished by 11 o'clock. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I miss my lunch. <laughs> so don't do things like that, just enjoy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> okay, so you've got two hours to kill before lunch. <laughs>